Hello, First Baptist Church friends and family. Thank you all for taking the time to pause your life, whatever's going on, whether you're watching this Wednesday evening, maybe some other time in the week. We want to say thank you so much for coming and joining with us. My name is Luke. I'm the youth and children's pastor here. Uh, this is Pastor AJ, leads our worship. He's our associate pastor on Sunday morning. You get to hear his absolutely wonderful worship leading. It's absolutely awesome. If, you, if you've not been joining us on Sunday, those are available online on our Facebook social media page that you can go see. And when you're there, you'll also get to see Pastor Jim, our lead pastor, bringing the word, walking with us through this series. On Sunday mornings, we've been going through a a Who's Your One series, looking at the life of Jesus and how Jesus invested, impacted, sought out individuals. It's been a great series. We've been walking through it this summer. It's been a lot of fun. And as we've been going through this Sunday series, we've wanted our Wednesdays to to complement that a little bit, to kind of be some bonus lessons, extra tools, things like that. We're trying to not only put a task before our church, but also resource, equip the church to give you all some tools, some perspective shifts, some some good lessons to learn, application points. And so today, we are, we've are we got a lot to cover today. We're very excited. Pastor H is going to lead us through some things. We've got some stuff up on the whiteboard for y'all. And so we are excited to get going. Before we get into it, one, one of the other things that we've been doing on Wednesday night is taking questions from you all and responding directly to, to what y'all want to know. If you have a question on any passage of scripture, better ways to share faith, or anything at all, you please submit them through our website or find us in the parking lot. Now, any way that you can get those questions to us, we'd love to take some of these Wednesdays and directly respond with what y'all would like to know. Mm -hmm. So get those questions to us, let us know what you think, and we, and without much further ado, we'd love to get into our topic for tonight. So Pastor AJ? Pastor Jim, would you like to pray for us as we begin? Let's start with prayer. God, thank you for a good day, and thank you for this time with our brothers and this time with our church. Lord, I pray that you fill our hearts with how much you love us and how much you care for us and how much you desire for us to follow you so that we can have life as you intended for it to be. Lord, show us truths that we need to know to apply to our lives today. We thank you for the scripture. We thank you for those that have faithfully prepared these methods and this, these ideas for us, God, just use them for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. If you will, uh, turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 17 through 21. If you have trouble finding that, 2 Corinthians comes after 1 Corinthians. Yes, that's right. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Luke. Very helpful. Very. Second Corinthians is different than Second Chronicles. Yes, it is. It does trip me up. Sometimes. That's in the Old Testament. Second Corinthians is in the New Testament. I always got that mixed up when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pastor Jim, would you read this passage for us? Sure. 17 through 21. Paul's writing here to the Corinthian church. He says, Therefore, verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old one has passed away, and see the new has come. Everything is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us this ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We Plead on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, In in this little kind of sub-series of midweek Bible studies, we've given you a number of illustrations, a number of different graphics, pictures, things for you to practice on your own. Uh, Several weeks ago, We taught you the ASAP, the Apply, Seek, no, Abide, Abide. Seek, Apply, and Produce model using Jeff and Jennifer as the the characters who represent Jesus' followers. We've also talked about the three circles diagram. Uh, Last week, we taught you a little little, uh, diagram called the the six-word testimony. Today, we're going to look at our fourth picture 
And if you will, grab a sheet of paper. This one, this one can be done in, in a scrap piece of notepad uh, paper. But I want you to, to really, I think this is a helpful image for us to understand why we should be about the business yeah. of evangelism from, from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So, verse 17 said that we are a what? A new creation. A new creation. So I'm going to put verse 17 here. Um, this is AJ. And the little lines around AJ can at least attempt to say he's a new creation. Okay, so what does verse 21 teach us? Luke, what does verse 21 say? He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So, because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, he took our sin upon himself and he gives us his righteousness in that exchange. So, this is verse 21. Verse 17 talks about we're a new creation. The, the bookend verse, the end verse, talks about how he took our sin and gave us righteousness. Now, let's look at the guts. Verses 16 through 20 say what? From now on, uh, no, verses 18 through 20, excuse me. Now, everything is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ was reconciling the world to himself. So, who is God reconciling in this passage? The world. The whole world. That's right. Mm. This is my attempt to draw lines of latitude and longitude. They're not very good. But that's kind of a world. I don't really know. Anyway, he sends us into the world as his ambassadors and his ministers. Ministers of what? Reconciliation. reconciliation. Mm. We're ministers of reconciliation. We are supposed to be the peacemakers of God we are supposed to engage a lost and dying world with the good news of salvation in Jesus. Because ultimately, and if, and, if, and if you don't want this, then you need to see us at the altar on Sunday morning and let the Lord convict you about what, what the Bible teaches. But ultimately, we want the whole world to be saved and to be made a new creation like God has made us as Christians. So this is the work of evangelism. Christ has done this to us and has sent us as agents into the world. And that's, that's a little bit like the, the gap between the second and third circle, or excuse me, the third and the first circle mm -hmm. of the three circles. He, because of the gospel, he sends us back into the world to be his agents. And so this is the why of evangelism. We've talked about the what, having gospel conversations, using tools like the three circles, using a, a six-word testimony, and sharing our faith with others. But this is the why, because God has called us to be his ambassadors and to be ministers of reconciliation into a lost and dying world that needs the gospel so desperately. What are your thoughts on that, Luke? Yeah, I think that's powerful. I think... What this captures so well is that the process that we should be taking part of, sin to righteousness, that transaction, that sacrifice, that propitiation, whatever term you want to apply to it, that idea that we repent of sin, believe in, have Christ's righteousness accredited to us, that's a 
personal individual aspect of our faith. And I think for a lot of us, we're content for it to end there. I've got my fire insurance. Mm. I've got my, yeah. I've got my, I'm taken care of. And, and then there's a myriad. There's so many reasons why we do stop there. It's, well, I don't know enough to go share with anybody else, or I don't know anybody else. I'm just or not I'm not comfortable. Ready. I'm not ready. There's a, there's a lot of other, and I, and I'm going to be frank. There's a lot of other good reasons why we stop, but there aren't any good enough reasons. That's right. So I think what this shows is the whole point of that process happening in us is is that as new creations, we can model what new creation looks like. For the creation that without it is go- is gonna fade away. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, pr- hopefully that we can be models and and ba- I mean, th- what else is an ambassador? It's a representation of what has happened. And I would argue, I would argue, if if we're not being the agents God has called us to be in the world, mm-hmm. then maybe we're not the new creation we think we are, mm-hmm. or. Maybe we don't really fully understand what exactly Jesus did for us as much as we should. Yeah. Maybe we maybe we aren't as convicted and changed as as Christ wants us to be. Yeah. You know, this brings. Yeah, I think I think the new creation is really key, mm-hmm. and everybody should be able to look at their own life and say, "Yeah, in this way, I'm a new creation in Christ." Mm-hmm. You define that. You define that. I I define that in our own how we were before Christ. We have to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. If if in your testimony you you can't say, "Well, I'm a new creation in Christ," yeah. then then that's where you go back to the Lord and say, "I need, I need, mm-hmm. I need to be created anew." Yeah. Because in order to be an ambassador, you have to be a new person. You, mm-hmm. You're not going to do that in your old self. Yeah. You're not. You don't have a desire. You don't have the ability. You don't have the power. And the ambassador means you go out. You're mm-hmm. doing something. You go from here to there. Mm-hmm. And so we have. That's an essential part of our job. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the failure of the church. Yeah. That's, that's the failure. Well, and this brings to mind, last week the, the students met and did some activities, played some games, and wore masks, socially distanced. We were safe and careful and everything. But throughout the week, we, uh, what would have been our focus at the summer camp that we had plans to go to, we would have spent multiple days on it, but we had to condense it a little bit. But we were looking at John 15. I'm the vine, Mm -hmm. you are the branches. Those who are a part of me, those who abide in me, those who who are branches connected to me, the vine, will bear fruit. And I use the example with some of our students that, you know, we we, we spent a few days talking about that idea. How do we do it? We walk through the three circles. That's a good tool to help bear fruit in our lives. But recently, one of the examples I told our students is my garden has exploded this year and I've had a lot of tomatoes. My tomatoes are growing, they're doing so well, but if a tomato is not doing well, it's not bearing fruit, what's the point of it? I'm going to prune it, I'm going to pick the ones that aren't any good, but the, the fruit that I've had, if, if I don't pick it, if I don't go out there, if I don't do anything with it, it's going to fall in the vine, it's going to fall, it, it's not going to do anybody any good. Mm-hmm. And so when we examine our lives as Christians, are we producing fruit? Is there a process happening in our own lives? And for many of us, when we talk, when we think about the process of sin to righteousness in our life, we can't think of anything except for 15 years ago when I walked the aisle and said, oh, God, come into my heart. That was the first fruit, and have we had fruit since then? Right. Some of us are hard-pressed to look at our lives and find evidence of God at work, which should be humbling and should be asking us, God, God how, can I, how can I do something? What do I need to change? How can I have testimony of the fruit that I'm bearing now. Well, and that goes back to the Jeff and Jennifer model, the difference mm-hmm. in, in milk and meat. Yes. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. right. I, I, think, I think it's really important. This is, not, this is not an exercise to say, well, you're, you, you, you're not here and you've got to be here. Yeah. This is an exercise in saying when you abide, when you're a new creation in Christ, you, you have a joy and a fruitfulness from being mm-hmm. a believer that yeah. you would never have otherwise. And I think each of us in our testimonies conveyed that probably in that time before Christ, we were all, by definition, anyway, we were, we were yeah. believers. We were all in a church. We probably had all been baptized when we talked about that. But we didn't have that joy. We didn't have the fulfillment. We didn't mm-hmm. have the growth. And, and that's what Christ really desires. When we yeah. abide, that's what we get. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And along with that is a desire to share. 
And I think, I think that's an important part of it. And I think the closer you are with Christ, the more you want to be an ambassador. Absolutely. Well, and, and one of the words in my six-word testimony was obedience. Mm -hmm. Jesus gives us the Great Commission. It is not optional. It is something that we've all been charged with right. as Christians. Um, in the book of Acts, we see in Acts 1-8 the work of evangelism. Here in Paul's letters, we're seeing more instruction in evangelism. This is, this is obedience. If mm -hmm. we're going to obey Scripture, we need to be about this work of evangelism. Right. Yeah. But it's not just this uh, this drudgery, this obligatory. Right. We don't we don't we're yeah. not just doing it because we have to and we're supposed to. We do it because we want to. Yeah. We do it because Christ got a hold of us <laughs> and we want Christ to get a hold of yeah. others as well. That's this right. should be a desire in our yeah. hearts as believers. That's and right. we've been referencing last week's video our six word testimony. Hopefully you've had a chance to see that and do that because to me this is such a clear what our six-word testimony is articulating is this sin to righteousness process. Mm -hmm. This idea that how we are a new creation, the model that's shown there. And it's, I mean, in my story, it was a lack of purpose then to discovering God's purpose. It was that idea of I just felt so aimless without you purpose. Said hopeless. And hopeless too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then because of this, I, I mean, and it wasn't an audible conversation. I didn't have a, a magical dream. It wasn't anything, but it was the realization that God just said, if you're going to squander your life, be about my business then, and I'll give you an eternal purpose. Mm -hmm. You, through your own failures, you, you can't accomplish anything on your own. But if you just look at what I want for you, there's a glory. And, th and that's when my spiritual life, well, that's when I took it seriously. That's when I started to see fruit. That's where I started to see inward fruit of fruits of the Spirit. I grew my, my relationship with the God. But then outward fruit of relationships and discipleship and reaching other people is as I grew through that, as I discovered, as I went from sin to right, and not trying to hold myself up, but as God did that work in me, I mean, when you put fuel in your car, it's going to run. Mm -hmm. When we as Christians start to take seriously God's promises to us, God keeps his promises. He does. That's right. He does. Now, we've, we've talked about God sending us into the world as ministers of reconciliation. I want to, I to, to, to kind of zoom mm -hmm. in a little bit. And, and you know, we, we think about the world, this very abstract very large concept. I want to zoom mm -hmm. in a little bit and think about what that tangibly could look like. Uh, those of you that have kept up with our Sunday morning sermons, you know that we're in this series called Who's Your One? There's a really cool, slick video published by the North American Mission Board. Uh, Dr. J.D. Greer is in that video. He, he talks about mm -hmm. the big numbers and how mm -hmm. we dream about the big numbers. And I, I, want to, I want to dream about the big numbers for just a few moments. In in Acts chapter 19, and I don't want to take away from our Acts sermon series, but in Acts chapter 19, we know that there's a scattering where the, the message of, of Christ is carried throughout Asia Minor. By the, time, by the time we get to the end of Acts, we know that folks that Paul encounters had already heard the message. We don't know who they had heard the message from, but we know the message had been carried. Mm -hmm. um, and, and biblical scholars help us to understand that in about two and a half years, mm -hmm. between Acts 19 and the end of Acts, we see anywhere from 8 to 15 million people had mm -hmm. heard the good news across the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. Now, Luke, guess how many people are in North Carolina? 8 to 15 million. Bingo! There are, <laughs> there is, there is, there are right about 11 million residents of North Carolina. So... If, if we were simply as obedient as the church mm -hmm. in the New Testament in Acts was, we could easily evangelize the entire state of North Carolina in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, and and those, those were Christians in the Roman Empire who were actively living under persecution. On paper, That's think right. of they how were far ahead living, we should be. They were actively living in a world where they were persecuted. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone who heard the good news heard it from a Christian. In fact, in Acts, we have reason to believe that the non-Christians were telling other non-Christians about what the Christians were doing. Man, what a great testimony it would be if our lives were so powerful and so different from the rest of our culture if non-Christians were talking with one another about what in the world we're up to as the church. Exactly. So, 
We, we could easily evangelize the state of North Carolina in just a couple of years if we were as obedient to this as the New Testament church was and by the way, in most the book of, of Acts. Most of these churches were small house churches. They were, they were very, they, they weren't nearly as large as most of our churches are today. They were, they were groups and pockets of believers in communities. That's right. That's, that's, I want to I look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. I know Luke is there. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. I want to unpack that for just a few moments and talk about the implications of that. Luke, are you, are you there? Yep, you ready for it? Yep. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Okay. Who is the you in this passage of Scripture? So, Timothy. Timothy. Mm -hmm. Who is writing to Timothy? Paul. Paul. Mm -hmm. So we've got Paul to Timothy. Tim he, he's committing to Timothy mm -hmm. to instruct faithful men, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Who will then share with a generation of others. Mm -hmm. So what we see here in this, in like what, two verses? we see a, a four generations right, of, of biblical evangelism. Mm -hmm. This is what discipleship should look like. Paul is pouring into Timothy, who is investing in faithful men, who would then invest in a generation of mm -hmm. others. And that's how evangelism and discipleship yep. should take place. Mm -hmm. It's a very personal thing. We can talk about the world and abstract numbers like 11 million people in North Carolina, but ultimately, it begins with very personal relationships where we invest in one another. What are your thoughts about that, Pastor? Yeah, Tim? I think I think it's really important that we recognize our role in the chain. If we stop, it stops. It, you know, we if our church doesn't evangelize, there's not a generation yeah. after it. We have to be, especially in our community. God put us here for a particular reason, so mm -hmm. I think we have to take our our job seriously yeah. to evangelize the people within our range of responsibility, the mm -hmm. people that we can reach and talk to. So there are, we, we are the generation of others. We are it. Yeah. Because three or four generations ago, there was a Paul. Mm -hmm. But we're also called to be a Paul. Yeah, that's right. And there should also be a generation of others three or four from now. We that's should, should be go. producing generations of Timothy out there too mm -hmm. uh, to carry on the message. That's exactly right. Yeah. I, I want to I wanna highlight something uh, from John chapter 17. Uh, in in my, my Bible, John chapter 17 is in red print. That means that Jesus was speaking these words. In fact, Jesus was speaking these words uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. He had already had the Last Supper, and he was about to be betrayed by Judas with a kiss. Uh, so he, so this is Jesus in the, the night before the crucifixion. This is Jesus grieving in anguish over the cup that laid before him. And let's see what Jesus prays in John chapter 17 and verse 20. I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their message. I would argue that we believe because mm -hmm. of the message Amen. of the disciples. Amen. So even as Jesus was in anguish the night before his own crucifixion, Jesus was praying for us as evangelists in 2020. So if, if we are faithful to the biblical instruction to be the ministers of reconciliation Christ has called us to be, we are entering into Jesus' high priestly prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's a little bit difficult for us to even wrap our minds mm -hmm. around. But we are actively entering into Jesus' prayer in John 17 when we are obedient to his instruction. Luke, what do you think about that? I mean, just think about that. Jesus thought of you. Now, I don't want to get too individualized. I don't want people to accuse me of reading myself into this. But think about Jesus prayed not only for those that he was with, but for the generations and thousands upon millions of Christians who would follow. That Jesus, knowing that what started with, I mean, 
Think about the odds stacked against the early church under right. persecution, so few of them, and they're the, and then and we read in Acts not too long later they get scattered. Yeah. The odds are stacked against them. But because I mean, but God doesn't care about odds, doesn't care about that and works and his message spreads and because of that Christ saw that and prayed for those who believe through their word. Mm -hmm. Something that I struggle with all the time and trying to articulate this is when we, I think when we try to talk with others about evangelism is there's a lot of sticks and a lot of carrots that we can use to try to convince people to share their faith. Well, you're really not a good Christian unless you do it. Well, you know, all these other people are really going to miss out if you don't. Well, think about how good you'll feel if you go. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons that we can use to guilt people, incentivize people, you know, all kinds of things. But to me, at the heart of it is just, this is so clearly the heart of God mm -hmm. that his children would not be content with his message being just for them, but that would be so burdened, so overcome with God's love that we can't help but share it with other people. Right. That's yeah. right. What a vision statement that Christ could, could envision not only people he's talking to, but the people that would hear mm -hmm. the gospel, the billions of people that would hear That's right. from what Jesus yeah. said. And let's not, let's not forget either that this is a prayer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you think God the Father hears and answers the prayers of God the Amen. Son? Amen. Amen. Do you, think, do you think that God the Father is going to ignore the requests of God the Son? Mm -hmm. I doubt it. So, when Christ prays for us, we are indeed uh, well, well equipped to be about the work of evangelism. I want to, uh, we, we mentioned the video, the Who's Your One video already. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that, in that video, uh, Dr. Greer says, yes, we, we dream about big numbers and we should. Mm -hmm. But it all starts with one. And we're, we, we talked about the personal relationship that Paul had with Timothy. I want to think in a very small scale uh, this evening for just a few moments. Get another, get another piece of paper out, and I want you to have a scratch pad that you can go through this exercise with on your own. There's, there's not a lot of accountability here, but one of the things I hope to do to members of our church in the weeks ahead is to say, who's your one? Uh, and to challenge them. Hopefully everybody has a one, but this is a little chart the Greek word here is oikos. Uh, if you are a, an eater of Greek yogurt, maybe you've heard the word oikos. It simply means the, the village. It, it simply means the, the village and the, the people around us. So this is me. This is my oikos chart. I'm going to put AJ right there in the middle. This is my chart. I did this. I don't know, I did this several months ago, over, over a matter of about a half hour, I was able to put 50 people in my Oikos chart. But what I want you to do, I want you uh, at home to think about three or four people in your sphere of influence that, that, that may or may not be saved. In fact, you think they probably don't know the Lord. So three or four people who are near to you and far from God I want the Lord to burden you with those names right now. Write them in. Write them in. There's, I got four right there. And I'm not going to tell you all of their stories because I don't, hope, hopefully one or two of them will end up watching these videos one day. But um, think about those in your, in your sphere. And, and it's really good if you're one is a, a relative of yours who may live in another state. That's really good. But I want at least one of your people to be somebody here in Stokes County that you could touch tomorrow if you had to. Uh, I, want, I want at least one of these people to be someone that you could lay hands on tomorrow if you had to. Think locally. Think somebody that you could rub shoulders with. It may be a coworker. It may be a classmate. It may be a teammate. It may be somebody that you encounter on a weekly basis at the bank or the grocery store. And I want you to just think, let the Lord burden your heart with these names right now. And really, this is a matter of prayer. It, it, it took me about a half hour in prayer to populate this little chart. Uh, but after about 30 minutes, the Lord kind of laid 50 people on my heart. 
These four people, this is Frank, this is a friend of mine uh, that I played in the band with at mm. Carolina. This is, this is John. John and I are members of a club together in Greensboro. This is Lynn. Lynn and I were classmates in high school. And this is Tom. Tom's a, a, kind of a friend of mine, and a very, we have a very unique circumstance. I met him kind of out of the blue three or four years ago. So Frank, John, Lynn, and Tom, none of them know each other. These are all four separate personal relationships of mine. Frank, I know, I know what he does for a living, so I'm going to pray for his co-workers. He's married, and, and, and his wife has a sister and parents. His folks are split up. So this is his sister. His mom is married. Uh, his dad is married to another woman now. Uh, so they kind of have a, a family cluster. He's also he also plays in like a like a like a like a ultimate frisbee league. Uh, he lives down in Charlotte. So there's a I wrote a teammate down there for him. This is John. I know he's got a couple of sisters and a brother. Uh, he's got teammates. He plays softball. I know he's got co-workers. He works for a municipal government. Um, this is his wife and his son. His wife has a dad. These are some friends of his, David and his family, some friends of his. These are some more friends of his that I know personally. I've met them. So uh, I was able to very quickly populate this thing by, by praying God burden my heart for folks who could become evangelists and reach the folks in their lives. And so if I reached him, and he reached three or four people, and they reached three or four people, how quickly could we put a dent into 11 million people in North Carolina simply by doing what Paul and Timothy were doing? This is Lynn. I don't know her as well now. We went to high school together. These are her parents and her brother. Uh, these are friends of ours that went to high school with us as well. Uh, this is Tom. I know Tom's got a pretty extensive network of friends here. He's got another rather complicated network of friends here and here. So, all in all, this is, these, these are 54 people around me. None of these four know one another. Now, that may, may be overwhelming. I don't want you to spend time putting 54 names on a sheet of paper. But it would be relatively easy to put a dozen names on a sheet of paper. It will be relatively simple to start with three or four. Each one of them, you kind of know what kinds of connections they have. Coworker is obviously not a name. Teammate is obviously not a name. But it would be really simple for us in a matter of five minutes to put a dozen names on our piece of paper. So I want, I want you to just pray through that. Pause the video if you need to and let the Lord speak to your heart about who you might have relationships with that you could leverage for the kingdom of God. Mm. Luke, what do you think about that? Yeah, it's powerful. It's heavy. I think when we set a big goal, it can be overwhelming. It can be intimidating. Oh, you, you expect me to reach 50-some people? I can't do that. So that's part of where our series, Who's Your One, our emphasis of looking. Even Jesus took the time to reach individuals. It, it starts there. And wanting to take measurable, achievable, actionable steps. I think that one thing that we can do is we want to give you this as homework to, to identify one, identify whether you write down three or four people, identify one that is going to be one that you try to reach. And if you've got a, a family member who's doing this with you or maybe a spouse or somebody who they're working through there, they've got their one, tell each other you're one. Pray, pray for one another, but also set a goal. I would like to share the three circles with my one by the end of the month, yeah. by the next quarter. By set a, set a, a goal, a realistic, achievable goal, and have accountability. Have someone say, hey, you said that you wanted to do this by Friday. This is your last week. Have you done it? Oh, I haven't yet. And don't get upset when people hold you to that. But do that so that way we can make sure that we are setting realistic, achievable goals but putting accountability into our lives to make that happen. Because we, we don't want to get so lost 
with our big numbers, big goals. Oh, we've got to we've got to go save the whole of North Carolina. I mean, that's that's incredible. That's awesome. Let's let's shoot for that goal. But before, but that's not step one. Step one is this: identifying people in our life, our oikos, our network, the community around us that we can leverage our friendships, relationships, family, and what we're doing, the sin and righteousness, that that being a new creation, we can be examples of new creation in their life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, do you, what do you think, Pastor Jim? Well, I think, I think it's really good. I think this is the way we envision the power of the gospel. Mm. And if we begin that, and you, you get a person in your life that you can share your faith, you, you pray about it, you, I think accountability is really good. Mm-hmm. I think having a vision of where it can go beyond one person is really good. And then, then you say, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go talk to this person. I'm going to have a gospel conversation. I'm not going to answer all the questions about the Bible with them, but I'm going to have a gospel conversation and build the relationship that I can talk about Jesus with them. Uh, you'll make a profound difference. We're not doing this to grow the church. We're doing this to impact the people that you're in, your community, the people you're with. So mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a great way of looking at how Jesus can impact those around us. And I think one last comment that I'd say is many of us worry something like this is going to affect my friendships. Something like this might cost me some people. If, oh, I don't want somebody to know that I think they're not a Christian or I don't want somebody to know that I think they need to change their lives. And, and, I, and I think we want to recognize that fear that people might have. Yeah. But I'd like to share just one last thing, which is there's, there's a book called The Four Loves by C.S. Lewis, where he talks a lot about relationships that we have with one another. And as he talks about friendships, he makes the great point that so many friendships start with a mutual interest, a mutual perspective, where when I and somebody else recognize you care about that too, you're interested in that, you, you have the same love as I do, and so a similar interest sparks a relationship. We like the same TV show. We're on the same Frisbee team. We have the same mutual interest, whatever. That starts a friendship. And that's good. That's fun. That, those are easy relationships to have. But what this offers is a relationship that's based on something eternal. That's Jesus. Mm-hmm. It offers us the ability to have a friendship of a whole new depth, to see each other as spiritual as people with the ability to have a spiritual relationship with God and be united in a way that's so much better than anything else. And that's a little scary and intimidating. But really, this is us caring about others so much that we want to deepen the relationships that we already have with them and to have an eternal significance. Yeah. So here's, here's your homework. If you, if you haven't finished this chart, take time and think mm-hmm. through it. And, and, and have a visual representation of what kind of kingdom impact you could have uh, if you were the minister of reconciliation that God's called you to be. You don't have to go reach 50 people. Just, just, just think through three or four in your life. They could be cousins. They could be children or grandchildren. Mm-hmm. They could be people in your family. They could be your next door neighbor that maybe you had a falling out with a couple of years ago. So just pray through the people that are in your sphere of influence. And I want to encourage you. I'm not concerned with, with training, but, but think about someone in this church or another Christian friend of yours that you could talk through these, these tools with in, in the months ahead. And think about when you might be able to do that. My goal, my personal goal, is to train three people outside First Baptist Church, three Christians, in some of these tools in the next couple of months. That's my personal goal. But more importantly than that, share... Share in either your six-word testimony or the three circles conversation guide. Share in a a gospel conversation with one of these people in a particular amount of time. And in the era of, of, of the coronavirus and social distancing, my goal is to share with one of these people within the next three months. That's my personal goal. That, I think that's a reasonable thing to do. It may be in person. Hopefully it'll be in person. It might be on a phone call. We'll see. Uh, but I'm also going to commit to pray for these four people once a week. Once a week. If you have more time, pray every day. Pray, tw- tw- pray twice a week. Put, put your chart on your refrigerator. Put it, put it in your car where you see it regularly. 
Put it on the filing cabinet in your office and let, let people ask you about it. Put it somewhere where these names are in front of your face and pray for them regularly. Pray for their hearts. Pray for their, their families. Pray that you would be a blessing to them in their lives. Pray for your own personal courage that you would be willing to be bold and have conversations that could be awkward. Pray that the Lord would convict these folks of their sin, that they might be saved and they might become radically changed as a result of Christ loving them. Mm -hmm. So pray for those folks uh, regularly. Well, thank you all so much for sticking with us. This may be the longest video that we've done, but it's so good. It's so much stuff that we need to know. We, maybe we need to be convicted of. Maybe we need to be taught for the first time. Maybe we need to be challenged in. So whatever it is, we hope that it's been good for you to watch. This has been edifying for us to watch and that we might spur one another on, challenge one another, hold one another accountable, and always be praying for one another. That we might be making God's name known, his glory apparent to those who don't know it, haven't yeah. been able to see that yet. So. Right. Thank y'all for sticking with us. Thank y'all for watching. And until next time, we will see y'all soon.